Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Nick. I'm going to be talking to you about growth hacking. Confession before I start. I've got about an hour's worth of slides. I'm going to squash into about 20 minutes. I'm going to talk quite quickly. Uh, there'll be plenty of slides. There's plenty of sort of data that you're going to write down. If you're going to try and write it down, I'm going to run faster than you. So the, the, the deal I'm going to make to you is, if you want to leave your business cards here at this sort of corner, I'll make sure I'll give you a, a soft copy of the deck before the day's over. So the first question is, what is growth hacking? Well, the term was first used in 2010 by a serial entrepreneur called Sean Ellis, who said, a growth hacker is a person whose true north is growth. I, what the heck does that mean? I, I have no idea. So I searched around the web and came up with some, some better quotes about what growth hacking is. And it's a non-traditional way of growing a business, more focused on the objective and the process, typically innovative, and some out-of-the-box thinking. So I've sort of combined some of these sort of thoughts and come up with my own impression about what growth hacking is. I'm going to just share that with you. The first thing is, there are no silver bullets, or as a growth hacker will tell you, there are no silver cannonballs. There is no secret toolbox. Anybody who comes to you and says, oh, we're just going to push that growth hack button, they're talking sort of garbage. Now, tools are important, but the secret is in the mindset, not the tool set. So you need to think like a growth hacker. So first of all, what's the difference between growth hacking and traditional marketing? Well, traditional marketing is used in more mature businesses, and they're happy with a sort of 10 to sort of 15% growth. If you're in a mobile games business, you're pretty much interested in a 10,000% growth. So you can't sort of take the marketing budget and sort of scale things up. So what you need to think about with a growth hacker is some solutions that are actually going to scale. What are some other differences between growth hacking and marketing? Well, they're probably more established um, and they have a longer frequency. Um, they typically have to people have an installed brand. Anybody here with an installed brand, you know how hard it is to sort of leverage those things. You probably have a small budget. There's a more uncertain or an untested product. Budgets tend to make people lazy. They begin to think in traditional ways, and they don't innovate. But the best quote I could find out from all these things is a chap called Sir Winston Churchill during the World War II. And he said, gentlemen, we have run out of money, now we have to think. That's the mindset you want to be in with a growth hacker. We have no money, how do we go about marketing our product? This is your game. It's the proverbial tree that falls down the forest. If they build it, they will come. Here's the key thing. If you have the greatest game in the world that nobody knows about, it's just the greatest game in the world that nobody knows about. Content is king, but distribution is God. You need to get visibility for your game. And we, we do the same thing. Visibility is oxygen. We were kind of naive. We thought if we made a really good product, it would just sell. But that's just not the case. You need to make people aware of what your product happens to be. And here's the problem. You type in best social game. This is what you get. This is actually real results. What's the problem? How often do people click here? Being 1 through 10 is orders of magnitude better being through 11 through 20 or 21 through 30. Next big problem. User acquisition costs are probably your single biggest expense. This is sort of data. And uh, Nordis this morning was saying that these are actually nearer to about $2, $2.50. So the cost per install is really, really, really expensive. History is written by the victors. Um, you learn about games that are successful, but you don't learn about the failures. And also, even the ones that are successful, just because they were successful and what techniques they use, it doesn't mean to say you can actually just leverage them. Kind of examples, you know, this sort of kind of video. If I sort of said you dress around as a fox and you bump it down, it worked for them, but it's not necessarily going to work for you in the future. Dumb ways to die, a little for the catchy tune, they managed to parlay into a sort of top setting game. Who remembers this? Flappy Bird? Potato Salad? What do all these things have in common? They're things that people have wanted to share, not because they're told to share, because there's something cool about it. Hey, check this out. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But at the end of the day, it's the product. You have a good restaurant because you serve great food, not because you tell people you serve great food. You actually need to serve great food as well. Anybody can sell anything, really, if you could growth hack something. But you know, players hate bad games, too. If you actually promote a game that's garbage, you can damage the industry for everybody. So at the end of the day, the first thing you need to do to be successful is actually make a great game. So first piece of advice is you know, serve great food. Don't be a used car salesman. Build a great product. So please, all of you go out there to start off with and get yourself a great game. A bit of talk about the sort of K factor as well, the virality of how things sort of scale. If I have to pick up the phone to talk to every one of my customers and say, hey, buy this game, surely I can convert them to buy the game. But 
that doesn't scale. I can't call up all my customers. What I want to do is call one customer who then tells two, two tells four, four tells eight. And when you talk about the K factor, um, I, this is more um, the viral side of things, but I'm more of a, a physics guy, so one neutron goes on, two neutrons sort of come out. But at the end of the day, it scales easily. Leverage other communication channels. I'm at Facebook. Use my channel to help get in contact with all your people. Don't have to try and sort of contact all those people yourself. A-B testing. Anybody here not doing A-B testing? Please go to RHGL, you'll leave the room. If you're not doing A-B testing here, you're, not actually, you're in the wrong business. So A-B testing is really important. A little bit of A-B testing humor there. It's the taste of the fish, not the taste of the fisherman. Don't be a prima donna. Um, if you've got your designers, they'll say, oh, no, this should be red rather than blue. It's like, no, test it out. Data levels all arguments. And iteration is the name of the game. When you're doing a product, try something. Learn from the results and the mistakes. Iterate. Wash, rinse, repeat. Wash, rinse, repeat. You should sort of be in this sort of iterative cycle. You need to measure everything. If you don't, how do you know if you've got better or worse? The famous quote from Buckminster Fuller, there is no such thing as a failed experiment, or an experiment with unexpected outcomes. Running this home, if you don't measure anything, how can you see if it's improved? Another quote from sort of, uh, Chris Lang. He used statistics like a drunken man uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. What does that mean? Well, let's say you've got your game and you think that, hey, if I reduce the price of this item in my store, I'm going to sell more. And you reduce the price of the item and you sell more. That's really just supported things. You've got no illumination. What you should be asking yourself is, how much do I reduce it and what's the incremental sales I get? And if I know the ratio of those things, I've actually sort of learned things from that. Testing always beats guessing. Be data-driven, adapt, fail, learn things. Always test things out. Again, running these points home, this particular guy. I never guess. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist the facts to suit theories instead of the other way around. Always be testing. It's very important. And then when you go into the room and you're arguing with your designers and developers, at the end of the day, you won't make me an angry because I back up my rage with facts, data, and documented sources. Who am I? I'm the credible Hulk. <laughs> if you can't get complete data, errors using inadequate data are much less than those using no data at all. The father of the computer sort of said that. OK, we've told a lot of sort of things. Let's actually get back to the games business. How much water is there in the bath? There is a fascination in this industry to talk about sort of Dow and Mao, although here at Facebook, um, they're all people. So you'll hear me say DAP and MAP for daily active people and monthly active people rather than users. It's the same thing, but it just, they're, they're sort of people. The height of the water in the bath is the people who are playing your game. And it can kind of go up and it can go down. Why does it go up and down? Well, people leave your game and people come into your game. The source and sinks. Imagine two scenarios. You've got a game. You've got a, a game with a, a million daily active people over here. Another game with a million daily active people here. And the same thing tomorrow. They, both games have a million daily active people. This game sucks. It loses people. It hemorrhages people at the bottom. They just gush out of there. But they've got a great user acquisition team who's bringing in new people every, every day. The water's still staying at the million. Over here, this game is awesome. It's cool. But the user acquisition team sucks. And they're not bringing any fresh meat, fresh eyeballs in there. If you just looked at sort of daily active people as a measure of success, you, you wouldn't be understanding what the problem is. So the problem you're trying to solve is very different depending whether you've got a source or a sink problem. So you need to understand what the problem is. So here's an important thing. Acquisition, engagement, retention, monetization. Go out tomorrow and make dashboards for these so you understand them. And even if it costs you money, go ahead and do it because the price of light is less than the cost of darkness. Let's look at some of those things. Acquisition. It's like a dating analogy. Anybody can get a first date, and you may have to spend some money, but at the end of the day, getting first dates. If you're in the acquisition business, you're in the eyeballs delivery business. How do I get users into my game for that sort of first time? Track where they come from, what's the most efficient use. I'm not going to talk about that sort of day, but at the end of the day, acquisition is very important. Can you get a second date? This is the engagement part of things. You've got the first date, that was easy. Getting the second date. Here's the frightening thing. One in six apps get a third date. How quickly can you get the users to that aha moment? They get your game, do I get it, do I get it? You're paying $1.80, $2 to get each of those users at the top of the funnel. If one in six of them are only going to get down to that sort of playing the app for the third time, you've lost a lot of that sort of efficiency. So getting users to that, you know, that tutorial, the idea of the simple, easy to play mechanic, 
One in six, that's, that's pretty scary. And what, again, this is a problem. Forget me not. Long tail of content. Did you know on Spotify, 20% of everything on Spotify has never been played even a single time. And you know that you talk about a million apps on the App Store. How many of those apps have been used by the, the guy and the guy's mother and his grandmother and nobody else? It's a really long tail of content. There's some data I don't get, I'll have to spend a lot of time on, but this is a probability uh, of the apps. Most people have a small number of apps on their phone. There's a probability on the y axis that says how likely you are to have there and the number of apps are there. So most people have between sort of 10. 10, 20, 30 apps. Not very many people have down to 100 apps on their phone. So there's actually a small number of apps that people are actually using on their phone all the time. And again, this, what this sort of curve is showing is that few apps are very popular. Right out at the bottom, you have the Facebooks, the Instagrams, and then the WhatsApps, and the Snapchats of this world. So it's happy families resemble another, but unhappy families are each in their own way. But the small little apps, they're spread across lots of very, very sort of thin little piles. Here's another uh, mouse type you're not going to be able to read, but it's just sort of showing you that the, the top 1% and 5% of games make a huge amount of difference. Activation in a relationship. Now you've actually sort of got round to sort of getting users back into the game. Buckets with holes probably need fixing more than they need more water. You spend all this money getting users into your game, and your game sucks. And, and then, you know, you've spent all that money. It's much better to actually get the basic core mechanic first. And in the past, there was all this sort of bogus advice that was yesterday's sort of version of the future. Where they said, well, use your customers as, as beta testers. Get them in there and work out what they like and what they don't like. That's wrong now. You need a pixel-polished game before you start, because the other day, you're spending all this money getting people to the top of the funnel, and then, well, the game's not right. They leave, and they never come back. Finally, you got through to the, the dating idea, down to the wedding. This is the monetization sort of part of it. Lifetime value is important. This is a marathon, not a sprint. It's the area under the curve. And kind of take care, because it tends to be the most valuable users are the people who come with the early adopters, and they can be the strongest emissaries as well. If you're, you're in the game industry, so you're all sort of uh, game fanatics, pack rats, you read all about the latest games. If somebody comes to you and says, hey, Nick, I played Farmville, I played this game, I played this game, what's the next best game I should play? You tell them. So you actually look at all the games, and if the games aren't ready when you test them out, you say, oh, don't use that game, it's not ready at all. So it's really important to have the game sort of ready before you start. You never get a second chance to make your first impression. People try a game, if it sucks, they're never going to come back to see whether you fixed it again. And the equation that we've, uh, we've heard about quite a bit today, but you know, if the cost per install is less than the lifetime value, you're kind of going to make money. If not, it's going to be the other way around. No big surprise. Free-to-play is the, is the way to go. Um, just about all revenue sort of now sort of comes from the sort of fleet play model. Yeah, there's a, it's remaining sort of constants. So you know, ongoing relationship with your sort of customers to so actually sort of keep on making money. Once upon a time, you, you'd be the brick and mortar stores, you'd go in there and, and buy a game, and then we went through the deluxe download model where you try a game for an hour and it sort of fused. But the game itself is this rolling advert for the game. So the game has to be cool and exciting. They'll play the game, they'll play the game. After about a week, the pay gate comes along and they say, well, yeah, I think I, the value proposition, I've had a couple of hours of fun with it. I don't mind paying that extra $2 to carry on playing and playing and playing and playing. So free to play is the way to go. The game is the advert you've got for itself. Finally, the dating uh, analogy, resurrection. Um, it's cheaper to bring someone back to the dead than to find somebody new. Um, some examples, uh, some Nordius. They spent uh, $3,500 on a re-engagement campaign, and they gained over $121,000 on immediate return. That was on a, using a Facebook uh, Canvas campaign. So keep at it. Everything compounds. For the mathematicians here in the audience, I can make a 1% improvement in my game for 365, one day for 365 days, and I've got a 37-fold increase. If I make a 1% decrease in my game, by the end of the year, I've got to about 2.5% of where I started. So it's a glass half full, glass half empty thing, but you know, keep at it. Small improvements every day. Growth hacking isn't new. Anybody remembers these things? Any ideas why a company would call themselves AAA Plumbing? Because they're at the top of the list. Why, if you search the uh, directory for hotels, you'd see Heathrow, Hilton Hotel, Hilton Heathrow, all canonical forms of the same thing, because they were trying to maximize the chances of getting there. When Facebook first started, there was a game, Little Green Patch. It was one of the, the top games. Why? Well, the braces searched alphabetically. It was at the top of the list. So this game always appeared at the top of the, uh, the list on, on Facebook. Jeff Bezos chose his company Amazon because it started with the letter A. So growth hacking isn't new. People have been thinking like this all the time. Seize every moment. There's an awful lot of science in growth hacking, but there's an awful lot of luck. When fortune shines on you, you have to be ready to exploit it. 
I got some examples later on, but there's a constant fire hose of content. You were exposed to sort of an ever increasing sort of amount of content every single day. Here's kind of an example of my, uh, my sort of Twitter feed that sort of goes by. You have seconds to get noticed. If you don't get noticed, you're just going to scroll off of the top. So you need some sort of friction. Creative headlines. Writing a good headline is really important to getting people into your game. I'm not saying you should do link bait, because again, going back to that garbage thing, if you sort of get, take people to somewhere where they're upset, then they're never going to sort of click on you again. They fool me once, fool you twice. But which of these headlines would encourage you to actually sort of click through and get through into your product? A couple of examples. Um, anybody remember the, uh, the mining accident in Chile? Some uh, creative guys at Oakley Sunglasses said, hey, let's ship them a, a, a carton load of uh, sunglasses so when they sort of come out, the, the bright light is not going to affect them. Over a billion people watch the rescue live. It's estimated that uh, $41 million of prime time logo were sort of shown on news just because some creative growth hacker at that company decided, hey, we'll ship them a, a container load of uh, sunglasses. If you look at sort of the, this tar narrow time window, this is the uh, Google sort of search query for, for Chilean miners. You can sort of see there's this incredibly narrow window to sort of get through. So you have to seize every opportunity. Maybe you've got a game about a Peruvian tree frog, and it just happens that on the radio, somebody's talking about Peruvian tree frogs. You have to be ready there with your marketing campaign to say, oh yeah, I loved your article about this. Here's the game that I have, and you can leverage and ride on the coattails of somebody else's um, things. And these things happen at any time. Anybody who tells you their marketing campaign, oh, we've got this sort of two-month marketing, no, you should be ready at five o'clock at night. If something goes out, you should be ready, and your uh, content team's ready to sort of push things out. Another example, Paris Hilton got banned from the hotel. I have no idea sort of why or for whatever reason. Some other hotel to the chain said, you know what? Paris Hilton's also banned from our hotel. Nothing to do with that, but the fact that they can ride on the sort of coattails and the Google spider picks up the Paris Hilton story, and if you search for it, you've got the competitor's hotel who would put a well-formed article with pictures and other things from there. Great growth hacking sort of idea. Um, this guy crashed a party at CES. He went to the thing. He got top headline news just because he went, oh, I just want to listen to music, but everybody sort of talked about it. Growth hacking, there are many possible ingredients. This is a, a read-along with Nick's slide, but uh, what should you be doing? Blogging, podcasts, webinars, e-books, white papers, guides, infographics, conferences, SEO stuff, keywords, publishing partners, affiliate marketing, link sharing, social media, contests, email, install-based marketing, app stores, paid installs, ads, tweets, backlinking, incentives, word of mouth, TV, Radio, oh, and Facebook. You should be using all these things to sort of encourage people to sort of come to your product. Why? This is a sea of content. You need to do everything you possibly can to get noticed. Quiz for you. If you're doing a kid's game, which of these icons would you use? It's a trick question. Test! Don't guess, and we remember. <laughs> Maybe three-legged dogs are really important. This head puts us the front off. As it happens, you're probably right. Um, eyes sort of make a difference. Uh, successful games seem to have icons, seem to have really big eyes. But also look at the sort of screenshots here. Looking at that particular game, instantly you understand uh, what the play mechanic is. Because again, you're flicking through games. Should I try this game? Should I try this game? Should I try this game? You've got milliseconds to get somebody's attention. Somebody told me that the, I don't know if it's true, but it's an urban legend, so I'll pass it on. The Angry Birds logo is red. Why was it they choose a red bird rather than a blue bird? Well, at the time when they launched it out, there was the mainly blue colored icons, and having a red colored icon, if you flip through all the sea of icons, it just stood up that, just that little bit sort of stronger, the chances of converting over. Again, another example, big eyes. But again, you can instantly see the play mechanic, what's involved. Really think and test which icons work for you, what screenshots you should put on there, because again, you've just got a few milliseconds to make a difference. 50 shades of blue. Google changed the shade of the blue on their advertising and made an additional $200 million a year just from the shade of blue. Wow. We don't have a lot of, sort of time to sort of talk about things, but um, when you're writing sort of headlines, there's this sort of concept of, sort of fuzzy trace theorem as well. It's like, when you leave here, what are you going to remember about this presentation? Well, in the short term, you're probably going to remember very specific details about sort of what's involved. But in the long term, you'll just get the, the gist. You say, well, when somebody asks you later on, did you go to Nick's presentation? Well, yeah, he told me all these slides. But if they ask you a week later, they say, well, oh my God, it's really brilliant. But I can't remember a thing he said, but it's the concept of what's involved. And it's the same time, I don't know if you visited um, uh, a comedian. You go on stage and, and you, you have a good time. You go home, you talk to your spouse. They say, well, was it a good time? Oh, yeah, it was really funny. Well, tell me one of the jokes. 
well, I can't remember a single one of the jokes, but I just remember he was really, really funny. And that's the sort of concept about sort of marketing that sort of goes through. It's not really a sort of Facebook pitch, but if Facebook integration isn't part of your strategy, you're crazy. Um, so crazy, I'm, I'm using sort of comic sans for this. Don't leave green on the screen. Facebook connected players convert better into paying users than non uh, Facebook users, uh, and they also spend more. Don't take my word for it. Wooga, nine times more likely to spend money than people who don't connect with Facebook. Players who log in with Facebook are three times more likely to return and seven times more likely to spend money. Facebook users spend 85% more. Hands up who does want an 85% pay rise. Well, why are these things important? Well, it's so much better to shoot your friends than shoot an anonymous stranger. It's so much better to knock your Uncle Bob off the top of a high score table than some kid in Nebraska who puts, puts Max into the top. It's relevant, and so I think Facebook Connect, it's really easy to do, and you can make more money from doing it. Why wouldn't you do it? There's over a billion people we can help connect you to. Just put the buttons on there. So you decide your company needs a growth hacker. How do you go about finding a good growth hacker? Well, you, know, you need somebody who loves data and understands it. Somebody who's curious, a little bit edgy and experimental. What can I get away with? What would happen? What if we change things? Leverages opportunities, moves fast, creates scalable solutions, and seizes all chance of visibility. Somebody also helps bake uh, growth culture in, into, in, into your uh, company as well. If it sort of helps at all, as far as data, it's a sexist job of the 21st century, by the way. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I love this sort of quote about uh, uh, growth hackers. Your job title states you're a hacker. If you're not breaking down walls and changing the way you're doing things, you're doing it wrong. Growth hackers are like MacGyver. They're like Swiss Army pen knives. They get things done. Everybody who tells you it's all about mythical unicorns, it's all sort of crazy. It's all about sort of uh, doing the right thing. You never outgrow growth. Facebook is now 1.3 billion people. And I proudly work on the growth team for Facebook. Okay, uh, we're moving to a little bit of an appendix, got a few more minutes. Why do people share things? There are six reasons I'll let into a secret about why, why people sort of share things and the story. Social currency. We share things that make us look cool. It's always like a first past the post. Who when you see the link? Always always the first. Oh, just well, look what I found. You know, look what I found. Look at this. Uh, check out this funny video. You always want to be the first person to post it because it makes you look cool. It's social currency. So if you can write a headline that encourages people to sort of share things, that's going to help get you. Triggers. We share things when we're reminded about things. Um, pick a game based on a current meaning. If you ever had a game about lampposts, every time you see a lamppost, you're going to be reminded about something. It gives you an extra trigger to think, help you think about sort of sharing things. Do everything you can to give people a chance to remember your app. Um, emotion. This is kind of important. All excitement, laughter, and anger, but not sadness. People share things based on emotions. Look at these cats. I can't wait to see this movie. Here's some uh, research on the New York Times. The most emailed headlines. Notice, if there's a sad headline, people don't share it. But anger, yes, that's a strong emotion, even though it's a negative thing, or an anxiety, much more likely to share. And there's a right brain and left brain sort of thing as well, the campaign effectiveness in terms of you know, whether they're more likely to be uh, emotional or, or rational. It might sound obvious, but people share things when it's easy to share. Put a button on there. If they have to copy the link, oh, there's a YouTube link, I have to copy it and sort of post it over, who's going to do it? If there's a button that says share, you can go ahead and share. So it's not just this, things like every play that I, I know they had some presentations earlier, but you know, make it easier to sort of share those buttons. Practical value. People share things that they think others, people get value from as well. Um, I think you're going to find this useful. Uh, this will be perfect to help you with all these things. So people like to be helpful to other people. And finally, people like to share stories. Not facts. If your friend's playing the latest game, say, hey, Nick, I was playing this game, and I played it, and it was so fun and so cool, I ended up playing it all night, and I played it until 3 o'clock in the morning, and I got up late, and I missed the bus, and my boss yelled at me. That's a story. People will share those things. If they just say, oh, it's a really cool game, it's not very exciting. People like to share stories. I call up the support line, and I complain. They ended up being so helpful, and they gave me this, and they gave me this, and they gave me this. Stories are much more important to be shared. Uh, we've got time to talk about this. Um, search goods and experience goods. Um, Search goods are probably If I go into a shop to buy a bag of rice, and I come out with a bag of rice, the shop hasn't really sold me the bag of rice. They fulfill me the bag of rice. I know I'm going in there to get something, and I've come out with the same thing. If I go into the store to buy some new pants, and I come out with some new pants, they haven't sold me those things. They fulfill me them. 
If I go into the store to buy some pants and I come up with pants and shirt and a matching tie, well, they've sold me those things. That's the difference between a, a search good and a commodity good. Um, you know exactly what you get before you've even tried it. Um, it's easy to buy and sort of sell. It's fulfillment, not sort of sales. You guys are in the business of um, selling experiences. If I said to you, hey, let's go see the movie Clippers, you have no idea what it's about because you don't know what it's about, because you don't know what it is. And that's what education is all about. Um, you need to be researched, and that's what, uh, that's what game demos do. That's what sort of trailers, and then once you see the trailer about what the movie Clippers is, you know it's always Attack of the Zombie Flesh Eaters from Mars, whatever it happens to be. What, you then know about what it is. It's easy to talk about what it is, and then you know exactly what you're going to get after that particular point. And that's why free-to-play is now the dominant uh, game genre. It's the advert for itself, the idea of play this game. Well, I'll try out the game, and then I know what the game is, so I know whether I'm going to pay for it or not. Your goal is to sort of move a product from an experienced product to a search product. Uh, so the idea of they know what they're going to get when they're paying for it. And final stuff, I've got sort of two minutes to talk about this, sort of anchoring. Sow your quality seeds early. Um, when you're getting reviews or sort of getting things, sort of things out, later reviews and comments tend to be biased by the first review. If the first person reviews your game, gives it a three out of five, and the next person comes along and thinks it's better than that, well, they'll give it a four out of five. Or if they think it's less than that, they'll give it a three out of five. But if the first person gives it a two out of five, then it's going to go three or one. So getting those first reviews early or, and, and curating and getting those things sorted out is really going to help you for um, promoting the product later on. And with that in mind, I think I've officially run out of time. I will have a chance to do some sort of questions afterwards uh, for about 30 seconds. Uh, but if you want to leave your sort of cards behind, I will quite happily email the presentation to you. Thank you.